Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 11. Paul's real name, of course, was Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus. That was his name. And because I've been asked to speak about Hebrew roots of the faith today, perhaps I shall open by praying in Hebrew. Not that that makes it any better or more holy, but when it gets upstairs, it won't have to be translated. Avina Malkeno and Nakta Modim Lahabish will call her Brahosh and Nakta Kibanimha. Anna Adonai Aksha, Tistaket, and Amshilan, and Tiferet Shalvarecha. The Brazdecha, Tenano Abba, Lorak is Moa, and Varecha. Vagamken, Brazdecha Nasod. The Shemshe Yeshua Hamashiach, Abneno, Goleno, the Sidkatino. Lord God, again we ask you to open our eyes, our minds, and our hearts to your word, its glory, and its meaning. And in your strength, Lord, we ask you that you would empower us to be not only those who hear, but those who do. In the name of our Messiah, Jesus, who is our righteousness, amen. Romans 11 comes in a section of Romans 9, 10, and 11. In the first eight chapters of Romans, Paul deals with the law, what it means. He deals with the law similar to the way he does in Galatians, in theme, but a different approach. Romans deals with the law proactively. Galatians deals with the purpose of the law reactively. Apostolic theology, biblical theology, always mixes the proactive and the reactive. What's the difference? When you proact, you simply say, this is what it says. This is what it means. This is the positive. And that's what Paul does in Romans. In Galatians, he reacts. There were people seducing the church with false doctrine, trying to put it into bondage to the law, and he reacts. Today we have people who get stuck in one groove or the other and fail to maintain the balance. We have people who say we should only proact, just teach the positive, God will deal with the negative. Just teach the truth, don't stand up, don't confront error, God will deal with that. Well that sounds very religious, and it is religious, but it's not Christian. It's not biblical. Virtually every writer of the Old Testament after Joshua, every prophet dealt with error. That was the main theme of the books. The people kept going away from the Torah, the proactive, and the prophets were calling them back to it. First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, First Corinthians, Galatians, James. All those epistles and others were reactive to correct some kind of error or false doctrine in the church. Those who say we shouldn't stand against error and so on, they're just not biblical, what they're saying. In fact, it goes so far in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and 3 John in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, God's prophets would actually name the names publicly of those leaders who led God's people astray. But then there's other people. They're only reactive. They only emphasize the negative. They go around all the time refuting error. Some of them go on virtual witch hunts. Some of them get a hold of one issue and that becomes the be all and the end all. I know people in Northern Ireland who are saved Christians. And the only way to know what those people are for is on the basis of what it is they're against. Now I'm totally against Roman Catholicism. It's unbiblical, totally against. But my own hatred of Roman Catholicism is very much based on my, first of all, love of Jesus, but my love of Roman Catholics. I can honestly say the reason I'm so against Roman Catholicism is because I'm so much for Roman Catholics. These people, the only way to know what it is they're for is what they're against. Everything's reactive. You always have this balance. And what frequently happens is people get hold of one issue and make it the be-all and end-all. When you make a truth, the central truth, you have a problem. There is only one central truth in the Word of God upon which all other truth is based. That is Jesus. Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ coming again. He's the central truth, the Scripture. There's people who get a hold of another truth, even though it may be true, and make it central. They make that the platform upon which they build all the rest of their doctrine. 
or they make it the prism through which they see everything else. One such issue is Israel. It is a truth. The prophetic purposes for God, for Israel, and the Jews are an important prophetic truth that need to be understood by the church, particularly in the last days. But I know people, they make Israel the center, Israel the prism. They wind up with an Israel-centric faith instead of a Christocentric faith, and they go way over the top. And as a result, they go into false doctrine. Some of them go so far as saying, we love Israel so much, we don't have to witness to them. They're God's people. People like the International Christian Embassy, they actually teach against witnessing to Jews. This is absolutely heretical. On the other hand, there's other truths. I'm a Pentecostal. I believe in gifts of the Spirit, and I believe in the work, person, and ministry of the Spirit. So what happens? There are some people who will take the charismatic issue and make that the central truth. And they see everything else through the issue of gifts of the Spirit or power of the Spirit instead of through the prism of Jesus. What happens when you do that? When you take another truth and make it central other than the truth of Jesus, that truth will in some way become an error. When you take another truth other than the truth of the Lord Jesus himself and put that truth at the center, and make that truth, even though it's true, the prism through which you read the rest of the Bible, that truth will become an error. We have to see Israel in perspective. We have to understand it, what it means to us, in light of the overall revelation of the Lord Jesus. With this in view, let's begin verse 1 of Romans 11. In 1 to 8, he deals again with the purpose of the law, how it points to the Messiah and our need for salvation, how it teaches about our fallen nature. But then the question comes, well, what about Jews? What about the Torah? What about the 2,000-year-old history of Israel? What does it mean for us now? You could, in a way, say Romans 9 to 11 is parenthetical, like it, 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 and then he goes back dealing with the same subjects he did in chapters 1 to 8, in chapters 12, 13, and so on. But really, it just, it's a natural flow when you read the overall context of a letter, because it is a letter. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed thy prophets, they have torn down mine altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? That which Israel is seeking for, it is not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it. For the rest were hardened, just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And this, of course, quotes from the Old Testament from Deuteronomy 29 and Isaiah 29. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and their, bend their backs forever. Not including, of course, the faithful remnant. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression be riches for the world, and their failure be riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection be the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And if the first piece of dough be holy, the lump is also. And if the root be holy, the branches are as well. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive, were grafted in among them, and became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember, 
that it's not you who supports the root, but the root who supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity. But to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more shall these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not want you to be uninformed of this mystery, my brethren, lest you be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, and thus all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Now it's interesting, verse 29 ends with the gifts and calling of God being irrevocable. Why does the text of Romans link the gifts of the Spirit, or the gifts of God, with God's calling for Israel? In, in Corinthians, you have the same connection between gifts and calling. And as this letter progresses, you have no chapter division in the original Greek. Into chapter 12, he begins talking about, right after this, gifts of the Spirit. So, in verse 5, we who are many are one body in the Messiah, and individually members of one another. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let's exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to his faith, if service, if teaching, etc. The letter links the gifts of the Spirit as being irrevocable, with God's calling to Israel being irrevocable. This is part of the reason why our early Pentecostal fathers, I go to the Assemblies of God Church in Farsley Leeds, from whom I bring you greetings in the Lord, our Pentecostal fathers understood this relationship. They were all premillennial, and they accepted fundamentally the purposes of God for Israel and the Jews, that they are the eternal people of God. Because the idea of cessationism, that the gifts of the Spirit ended with the early church, comes from the same error that God's purpose for the Jews ended with the early church. They both come from the same error. He links both of them, the gifts and calling. Right after this, he talks about the gifts. Before this, it's the calling. The idea that there's a different dispensation now than there was in the early church even though there is a truth in dispensationalism, it is a truth taken too far by these people. The same theological root that says God is finished with the Jews is the same theological root that says God is finished with the gifts of the Spirit. That's why he links the two. But our Pentecostal fathers understood this was not so. It's amazing. We never had too many Greek or Hebrew scholars, but the founders of Pentecostalism understood what they believed and why they believed it. They didn't have an experiential theology. Not many of them were scholarly or academic, but they certainly knew the Word of God. Now that's mostly gone. But let's begin at the beginning. Let's put this in context. Jeremiah 31, 31. Yermiyahu Hanavi. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers. We say in Hebrew, to cut a covenant. To cut a covenant is how you make a covenant. First of all, look with whom the covenant is made. Is it made with the church? Does it say the new covenant will be made with the church? No. The new covenant was not to be made with the church. Jesus never gave a new covenant to the church. 
He didn't make the new covenant with the church. He made the new covenant with Israel and the Jews. The Bible never teaches he made a new covenant with the church. So therefore, if he's finished with Israel and the Jews, he's finished with the new covenant. Because he didn't give the new covenant to the church, he gave it to Israel and the Jews. But let's understand further. To cut a covenant, what does that mean? In an ancient Near Eastern suzerainty ritual, you'd have a fellowship meal and things like this when you made a covenant or a contact, a contract, a haskimah or a brit, brit. And you would sacrificially sacrifice, uh, bisect a, an animal. You would, you would bisect its carcass of an animal in a sacrifice. And both parties making the contract, the suzerain, the ruler, and the person he makes the covenant with, would pass between the two halves of the bisected carcass. Now, in the ancient Near East, the validity of a covenant was never dependent on the second party. It was only dependent on the suzerain, the person who made it. There would be consequences if the other party broke it, but it did not invalidate the covenant because that would be a insult to the suzerain. It would mean that the ruler was losing faith. He had to be faithful even when those who made the covenant with him weren't, even though there'd be consequences. This is what we see in the typology when God makes the covenant with Abraham. Look at Genesis 15. We call Genesis in Hebrew, Breshit, Breshit, in the beginning. Verse 17, And it came about when the sun had set, that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these two pieces. This flame is called in Hebrew, Shalhevet Yah, the flame of Yahweh. It is the same as the pillar of fire in the Shekinah, the Shekinah. Notice it's only the flame of God, only the Shekinah that goes in between the two halves of the animal, not Abraham. God knew from the beginning that he would be faithful and keep the covenant even though Abraham wouldn't. That is both Abraham's physical descendants, the Hebrews, and his spiritual descendants, the church. The validity of a covenant does not depend on the unfaithfulness of man, but rather on the faithfulness of God. If God is finished with Israel and the Jews, I'd like to know one reason he shouldn't be finished with the Gentile church. Now, they did terrible things. Ultimately, they rejected their Messiah. There was two times when God became totally fed up with Israel. And for a season, he said, Lo Ami, you're not my people, as the prophet Hosea puts it. The second, of course, was the rejection of the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua. But the first was the Babylonian captivity and the fall of the northern kingdom to the Assyrians. There was a lot of sin and morality, a lot of social injustice and open idolatry. But the most serious of all was when they were sacrificing their babies to other gods. We're told in Deuteronomy other gods are shedim in Hebrew, shedim, demons. And we're told in the New Testament, Paul quoting it, or in the Septuagint from the Old Testament, Paul uses the word in the New Testament, demonoi. Other gods are demons. It says it in both Testaments, quite clearly. Ari Krishna is a demon. Demons. That's what they are. The god of Freemasonry, Yabalat, is a demon. Osiris and Baal. I was just in Scotland and there's Christians, actually born again Christians in Masonic lodges. I told them to burn the aprons. They don't like that, but that's what they need to do. Other gods are demons. And the worst abomination that caused God to get fed up was when they were taking their children, their babies, and sacrificing them to these other gods. Let's look at our nation in light of what Romans 11 says. We're told in Romans 11, if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either, in verse 21. A Christianized nation. If you were to take, again, as I often point out, 
all of the clinical reasons for abortion and put them together. All the clinical reasons. Ectopic pregnancy, vaginal cancer, radio-induced mutagenesis during gestation, all of the clinical reasons. They would account for less than 1% of the babies aborted in Britain. The other 99 plus percent are aborted for socio-economic reasons, something that Jesus called the worship of mammon. Make no mistake about it, non-therapeutic abortion is very much the modern equivalent of demon worship. These abortion mills are nothing more than the latter-day temples of Molech and all this. That's all it is in God's economy. So if he didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. I was in South Africa last month, and when I was in Africa, I was disturbed when I came back to Britain because I picked up a copy of Time magazine. A bitter embryo imbroglio. One day, last month, in one day, 3,300 human embryos, by law, were systematically executed by exposure to a saline solution in England. 3,300. One day. One day. I'm not talking here about unmatched heterozygotes, unfertilized ovum. This is DNA paired, uh, DNA paired. IVF implantable 100% human embryos. 3,300 were destroyed. And I came back and I checked. The very day this happened, the very day this happened, our biggest Assemblies of God church in Sunderland, our biggest Elam church in London, the biggest Anglican church in London, biggest Evangelical Anglican Church in London, Holy Trinity Brompton. The very day, the very hour, when these 3,300 embryos were being executed, our biggest Pentecostal and charismatic churches at the behest of their leaders were rolling on the floor in hysterics laughing. That's the kind of church we have. That's the kind of leaders we have. That's the kind of nation we have. If God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. I know what we have to fall down and weep about. It says in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, revivals always begin with people weeping, not people laughing. I know what we have to fall down and weep about to beg God to withhold his judgment from this nation who is backslidden from its Christian principles. And we have to fall down and weep about, but I don't know what it is we have to laugh about. And because I say this publicly, I'm told I have a wrong spirit. I'm blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I'm grieving the Holy Spirit. I'm the bad person. Keep away from Jacob Prask and his friends because he says this. If he didn't spare the natural branches, if Israel and the Jews did not get away with this, England, America, Australia are not going to get away with it either. At least they had Jeremiah's who were standing up and warning Today, our leaders are standing up and say, laugh about it. Just have a laugh. God's doing something. God is doing something, they say. And if you read what happened, <coughs> if you read what happened in the book of Jeremiah, immorality went on a rampage. I was in Scotland the other day, and I picked up a copy of the Daily Mail. Europe sparks flood of porn filth. I myself am very careful to keep my political views separate from my Christian views. However, it is a fact. By the year 2010, 80% of Great Britain's laws will be made not by Parliament, but by bureaucrats, unelected bureaucrats in Brussels on back of closed doors who you didn't vote for and can't remove. It's not the loss of British sovereignty, it's the loss of British democracy. But, and I have no doubt whatsoever, what you see in the continent is the prophecy of Daniel's vision, the fourth beast, I have no doubt. But the European court decreed you had to allow this pornography to be broadcast into this nation. 
from the continent, mainly Holland, Germany, and Denmark. And this pornography, it's not even normal sex. A lot of it is homosexuality, bestiality, things that are not even normal. And you have no legal recourse. Your government can do nothing. Europe has decreed you have to let it in. I turn the page. Gay Britons join the rush for a surrogate child. The legal precedent has been set now. Two homosexuals, males living together, have as much right to adopt a child as Jack and Jill, as you do, and bring them up to be homosexual in a homosexual environment. Uh, lesbians have a right to artificially inseminate. As much right as you do to have kids and bring them up believing that's normal. And we're being told by our leaders God is doing a great thing. And they're rolling on the floor in hysterics and laughing. God is doing a great thing? Well, when God did a great thing in John Wesley's day, the powers of darkness were thrown back over this nation. When God did a great thing in the book of Acts, when the real fire fell, 3,000 were saved the first day and 5,000 the second. After three years of this in Britain alone, I don't see thousands being saved. All I know is unsaved people who saw the 9 o'clock service in Sheffield on television with women dancing topless at Toronto meetings. That's the only thing I've seen. And I'm told I have a wrong spirit because I don't agree that God is doing a great thing. Well, I, I do think God is doing a great thing. God is doing a great thing. The question is, which God? You understand? If you didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. In America, now that the laughing thing is fizzled, they have something called promise keepers. Over here, it's alpha courses. If you really want to read something, read this. We have some copies out back published by some evangelical Anglicans who tell you what alpha courses really are and where it comes from and what their beliefs are. It's not biblical. But in America, it's promise keepers, which they're trying to bring over here. Let me read you from promise keepers. This is their literature for male discipleship. This is endorsed by Dr. James Dobson, a man I always respected. And in this, they have a book at their big rally in Colorado, their first big one. They gave out 50,000 copies of a book, The Masculine Journey. No mention of Jesus Christ. It's not a Bible. It's just written by Robert Hicks, who's a New Age writer. And they imprimatured it. They put their seal on it, meaning that they approve of what's in it as Christian doctrine. They imprimatured this book. Our culture has presented many initiation rites or passages to manhood that are associated with the phallus, the male sex organ. Which ones have you experienced? Do you have a story to share with other men about one such an event? I'm sure many would balk at my thought of celebrating the experience of sin. I'm not sure how we could do it, but I do know we need to do it. We need to celebrate the experience of sin? What kind of sin do you think they telling us we need to find a way to experience? How about teenagers losing their virginity and taking dope? For example, we usually give the teenagers in our churches such a massive dose of condemnation regarding their first experiences with sin that I sometimes wonder how any of them recover. Maybe we could take a different approach. Instead of jumping all over them when they've had their first experience with sex or drugs, we could look upon this as a teachable moment and a rite of passage. Is this putting a benediction on sin? Of course not. But perhaps at this point, the true elders could come forward and confess their own adolescent sins and congratulate the next generation for being human. Congratulate the next generation for being human, for taking dope and losing their virginity before marriage? Many would balk at the suggestion of celebrating sin. I'm not sure how we could do it, but I do know we need to do it. 
God becomes a man in the person of Jesus to hang on the cross to save us from hell for our sins, and they want to find a way to celebrate it. What sins? Kids taking dope? By the time I was 16 years old, I was experimenting with heroin and taking LSD all the time. By the time I went to university, I was addicted to cocaine. Jesus saved me. I have friends that I was a teenager with, that I went to university. I have friends who are dead, as far as I know, in hell forever because of drugs. A Christian male discipleship movement is telling me to find a way to celebrate it? Aren't you afraid of your kids being exposed to drugs in the schools? When I was a teenager, practicing safe sex meant you locked the car door. Today, the teaching kids in schools carry condoms. I'm a good girl. I've got these in my pocketbook. What's the church saying? HIV is spreading among teenagers. Congratulate the next generation for being human. Oh, you lost your virginity last night, huh, kid? Well, I remember when I was your age. I was 16. I was thrown out of prep school for syphilis. Welcome to the club. That's sick. That's evil. The Bible teaches male fellowship on the basis of scripture, not male bonding. Promise keepers is male bonding. The Bible teaches male-female bonding. The husband shall cling to the wife and shall become one flesh. Devich, achdut. Male-female bonding is Christian. It's biblical. Male bonding is not a Christian concept. It comes from vineyard. It's a new age concept. It's a homosexual concept. Male bonding is, 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 is new age, and it's homosexual, but it's not Christian. It's not biblical. But if this is the state of the church, if that's the church, if that's what the church is teaching, evangelical church, by the way, although there are a lot of Mormons and Roman Catholics in it, if that's what the body of Christ is teaching, what do you expect from unsaved people? What do you expect from the world? But then they say, I'm the one with the problem. I'm the one with the problem. 3,300 kids are executed in one day, and I say it's a disgrace that the church was not fasting and praying against it and screaming at the top of their lungs instead of rolling on the floor laughing, but I'm the guy with the problem. Look out for me. I'm the one who's going to get you in trouble. My family are Jewish. My wife, my kids are Israeli. Jews. I'm telling you something. If God did not spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. He loved Israel. He chose Israel. He desired Israel. But he didn't need Israel. But let's continue. God has not rejected his people, has he? No, it says he hasn't rejected his people. And what he says is, the 7,000 who did not bow the knee to Baal are the faithful remnant. The 7,000 in the days of Elijah were the faithful remnant. Today, Jewish people who accept Jesus as the Messiah and are born again, like my wife, my kids, and so on. They are the faithful remnant of Israel for this time in history. Now we have to understand what is a Jew? Look at Romans chapter 2, verse, verses 28 and 29. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit and not by the letter. Jewish people in the days of John the Baptist, Yochanan Hamadbil, some of them thought because they were circumcised or physically descended from Abraham, they were cut above the rest. Hmm. They may have been a cut, but not above the rest. What did John the Baptist tell them? God could raise up Abraham's children out of the stones. The prophet Isaiah put it this way in chapter 60, 
3. Verse 16, for thou art our father, though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not recognize us. That's about Gentile Christians. Abraham is your father, even though the Jews don't recognize you as such, unless they're saved Jews. He's your father as well. You see, it was not enough to be physically Jewish, or physically circumcised, or culturally Jewish, or religiously Jewish. Circumcision was always a matter of the heart. Let's look at this in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 9. Twenty-five and twenty-six. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will punish all who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised. Egypt and Judah and Edom and the sons of Ammon and Moab and all the inhabitants of the desert, etc. I will punish those who are circumcised and yet uncircumcised. They were physically Jewish. They were culturally, religiously Jews, but not spiritually. And look what happens. When they go away from the Torah, when they go away from God and His Word, Egypt and Judah and Edom. They're just sandwiched in between two Gentile nations. They're no better and no different than any other people. I find these people who have this infatuation with Jews and with diasporic Jewish culture, Yiddishkeit. There's nothing special about Jews. There's nothing special about Israel. Nothing. They're people who need to be saved. But there's something very special about the God of the Jews, the covenant of the Jews, the book of the Jews, and the Messiah of the Jews. That's what's special. Now, Jews have a cultural advantage. To them belong the oracles of God. If they accept Jesus, they do have an advantage, culturally, but not spiritually. There's only two kinds of people, the ones who are saved and the ones who need to be. Going over the top about Israel as is unbalanced on one extreme as ignoring the Bible's teaching about it on the other. Circumcised but not circumcised. Ezekiel 44, 9, same thing. Thus says the Lord God, no foreigner uncircumcised in, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh. It wasn't good enough to have physical circumcision. Jeremiah 4.4. 4. Yermiyahu Hanavi, I love him. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart. Moses says the same thing in the Torah, Deuteronomy 10.16. It's always of the heart. They were physically Jews, culturally Jews, religiously Jews, but they were just as pagan as the Gentile nation sometimes was. Let's look at the church. Of all the people in the world who claim to be Christians, to practice the Christian faith, of all the people, one point something billion, they're culturally Christian, religiously Christian, Maybe they've been baptized or something like this. Of all the people who claim to be Christian, how many do you think are truly born again? A relatively small percentage. In this country this morning, fewer than 10% of the people in England will attend any church of any description. Roman church, Mormon church, anything. Only about 2% or 2.1% will attend an evangelical church this morning in England. Unless it's a rite of passage, unless it's a wedding or a funeral, they won't go at all. This morning, that's all. Only 2% of the population will be in evangelical churches. You take out the Afro-Caribbean immigrants from the big churches like Kensington Temple and the Asian immigrants, how many indigenous English people Anglo-Saxons and Anglo-Celts, do you think, are born again? 
There was never anything more than a faithful remnant of Jews who were loyal to Moses, didn't rebel against him in the wilderness. There was never anything more than a faithful remnant of Jews who did not murder the prophets. There was never anything more than a faithful remnant of Jews who did not reject Jesus as their Messiah. But there's never been anything more than a faithful remnant of Christians either. Even way before the Reformation, God always had a people for his name here in England, long before Luther or Calvin, you had the Lollard, the followers of John Wycliffe. On the continent, you had all kinds of people, the Bohemian Brethren, the Waldensians, even before the Reformation. There was never a time when God did not have a people for his name. He always had a faithful remnant of Jews. Benjamin Disraeli, the prime minister, was a Jew who believed Jesus was the Messiah. Felix Mendelssohn, the composer, wrote the music, The Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Charles Wesley wrote the words. He was a Jew who believed Jesus was the Messiah. There's always been a faithful remnant of Jews. But there's never been anything more than a faithful remnant of Christians either. If he's finished with them, why shouldn't he be finished with the church? What have they done? Reject the covenant? Yeah, they did. Reject their Messiah? Yeah, they did. But you see, the church is more guilty than the Jews. Why? One, they only have the old covenant. We have the New Testament as well. They only look forward to the first coming of Jesus. We look forward to his second coming because he's already come. They only look, they only look to the first coming of the Messiah. We've already got him. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was only for certain people at certain times, kings, high priests, and prophets. Now it's for all who believe. On top of that, we have their example to learn from. Well, much is given, much is expected. The backslidden state of the nation Israel and the Jewish people is an abomination. The backslidden state of Great Britain and America and Australia are an even greater abomination because we should know better. But let's understand this. Let's understand what he's talking about with these fig trees. Look over here, please, and I'll explain it the best I can. This is an olive tree. Everything under the surface is the Old Testament. Everything above the surface is the New Testament. This is all the Old Testament. This is all the New. It's one tree, not two trees. It's one tree. In the Old Testament, the root, the Greek word is reza. Reza. You know when you see a tree, an olive tree, blossoming, you know it has a root that's alive. If the root of that tree was dead, the tree, tree would be dead, wouldn't it? Metabolically, the tree could not survive apart from its roots. You don't see the root, but it's there. If it wasn't there, the tree would be dead. What Paul says is, if Israel is not there, even though you don't see it, it's under the surface, it's the root. If that is dead, so is the tree. If God is finished with Israel and the Jews, he's finished with the church. He didn't give the new covenant to the church, he gave it to them. Now, in the Old Testament, most of the branches of the root were Jews. But if you notice, there's certain Gentiles. Zipporah, the wife of Moses. Ruth, the book of Ruth is dedicated to the subject. Uzziah, Caleb. Quite probably Job. Most of the roots are Jews. But even in the Old Testament, you had Gentiles who had been grafted in in some way. Now it's the New Testament. 
The root is still there, but it's the New Testament. The lower branches are Jews. The first Christians were Jewish. Every writer of the New Testament was a Jew except for Luke, and he was a Gentile who converted to Judaism. The only reason we have the New Testament, the New Covenant, is because Jews wrote it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Barnabas, Mary, they're all Jewish. The lower branches are Jews. But then Gentiles are grafted in. Only in the Old Testament, Gentiles were the minority. Now, after the apostolic age, they become the majority. Why? Because those Jews who rejected their Messiah, and by the second century, 25% of the Jews in Jerusalem believed he was the Messiah, according to Jewish history. Jews rejecting Jesus were cut off. Those Jews who reject Jesus now, Romans 11 tells us, are the equivalent for this time in history what those who worship Baal were in the Replace Jews who reject him. But it's the same tree. The church does not replace Israel. But then he goes on to say, I tell you a mystery. And in this mystery, he says, the time of the Gentiles would come to a close. And he uses two Greek words, platheron until an ethnon, nations, Gentiles, the Hebrew of Goyim. Jesus used those same two Greek terms, or at least the Matthew, he spoke Aramaic, but Luke 21, 24 uses the same two Greek terms, platheron, ethnon. Jesus said, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. Paul says, I tell you a mystery, until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Both Jesus and Paul tell us the time of the Gentiles would come to a close. He turned his grace for a season from Israel to the Gentiles. But in the last days, he turns it back. And it's happening. It's happening. I'll be in Israel next week. You know how many thousands of Jews have become believers? In the, the number of Jewish Christians in Israel has quadrupled in the last five years in Israel. In the United States, there are tens of thousands of Jewish born-again Christians. More than 90% of them saved in the last 15 years. In Britain, Australia, just in South Africa, a lot of Jews being saved in South Africa. I had one of the leading neuroradiologists, a specialist in uh, nuclear medicine for brain diseases, her and her husband, very prominent Jews, and they were saved through our ministry recently, and they have a high social profile because of their position. They're among the wealthiest people in South Africa, and these are people with a social cost to pay, and they're turning to Christ. So, in other words, the first Christians were Jews, but the last Christians were going to be Jews. The first Christians were Jews, and the last Christians are going to be Jews. Many people believe this is part of what the 144,000 in Revelation is. But look what it says about Ariza, the root. Verse 18, do not be arrogant towards the branches. That is the natural branches. Remember that it's not you who support the root, but the root who supports you. He's warning Gentiles not to be arrogant towards Jews because the root supports you. One of my major qualms has been Kingdom Now Theology, Restorationism, which is totally replacementist and which has invaded our Pentecostal denomination. The Assemblies of God tried to bring in Rick Godwin from America, but fortunately enough, the Assemblies of God ministers wrote letters of protest, and it didn't happen. Rick Godwin teaches the Jews get nothing. The Jews have no right to be in the land. Israel is nothing but wasted money. It's nothing but garlic. And he teaches Christians to be against Israel. And he's on his tapes. We have the tapes. Don't be arrogant. The root supports you. But then he also says, it happened to provoke them to jealousy. Jesus is coming for a spotless bride. Let me tell you, 
It's going to take one spotless bride to provoke Jews to jealousy. My wife's parents are in the Holocaust, the Romanian Jews. You ask them what's the gospel of Jesus Christ, they'll tell you. My wife's father was killed. Most of the family were killed in the Holocaust. And they had to run away from the Gestapo as kids. And they were told this was a Christian movement. And the, the Russian or the Romanian Orthodox Church was supporting the Nazis. I said, what is it? So you ask her, what's the gospel of Jesus Christ? She'll tell you. The gospel of Jesus Christ is Jewish children being kicked into an oven in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, it's not going to provoke the Jews to jealousy. You see, it says, if their rejection be the reconciliation of the world, what will their restoration be but life from the dead in verse 15? Look at verse 15 carefully. You see what it says? God is going to bless the church through Jewish people before Jesus comes. He blessed the church through Jewish people in the beginning of the church, and he's going to bless the church through Jewish people again. We have four Gospels written to us by Jews. We have epistles written to us by Jews. The Spirit said, Set out for me Paul and Barnabas. Jews were called to be Orla Goyim, a light to the nations. But it's only Jewish Christians who can be lights to the nations, Messianic Jews. In the beginning, God blessed the Gentile nations through Jewish people, didn't he? In the beginning of the church. Well, that's going to happen in the last days. And I'm quite convinced Revelation 7, the 144,000, has something to do with it. So I'm not completely clear as to how. Our future is bound up with their future. Jesus told them, you will not see me until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In Zechariah chapter 12, it says the following, verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, so they'll look upon me who they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. The Jews will look upon the one they rejected who was crucified, who was pierced, and realize he was the Messiah. And then as he comes in chapter 14, he sets up his millennial kingdom, doesn't he? And it's, as a Pentecostal, it greatly, greatly grieves me to see our Pentecostal churches moving away from our own heritage. Our Pentecostal fathers knew these truths. They understood that the purposes and plan of God for the salvation of the world was prophetically bound up with his plan for the salvation of Israel. They understood that God's eschatological plan for the salvation of the world, finally, would be bound up with his prophetic purposes for Israel and the Jews. And they understood that replacement theology and cessation theology were two legs of the same table. A lot has happened. But let's look just a bit further. Verse 25, the hardening upon the Jews is partial and it's temporary. And he goes on to say the following. How can God bring the Jews in? The person who explained this the best of anyone I ever heard was Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And I'll tell you, when Dr. he wasn't a Pentecostal, but he did, was baptized in the Spirit. When Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones went, a lot went with him. He was the preeminent expository Bible preacher of this country, of this century. And there hasn't been anybody of his caliber since. And ever since he went to be with the Lord, the general standard of expository preaching has gone down and down and down. And the man who's standing in his pulpit now is, a, is, is an absolute is a disgrace compared to what it was when he was there, bringing in these crazy people from America. As Dr. Jones explained it, and he was right. Let's read it again. Verse 17. 
But if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches, Rick Godwin. But if you are arrogant, remember that it's not you who supports the root, but the root who supports you. He will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Quite right, they were broken off. But you stand by faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. If God did not spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. Behold the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell severity, but to you God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And he's warning the church. And they also, if they do not continue to believe in unbelief, will be grafted in again, for God is able to graft them in again. And more and more Jews are being grafted in every day. According to the American College of Rabbis, again, more Jews have become believers in Jesus in the last 18 years than in the last 18 centuries. Verse 24, For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated tree, how much more shall these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own tree? As Martin Lloyd-Jones correctly explained it, it's not how God could make the Jews believers in Jesus and graft them in again. They're the natural ones to be believers because Jesus is a Jew. He's already done something more difficult. He's taken pagans. He's taken Gentiles, people of other nations, and made them believers in Jesus. In God's economy, taking people who had no Torah, who had no Moses and the prophets, who had no Jewish heritage, who did not have the oracles of God, to take the Greco-Roman world and what came out of it, including Britain, and to make those people believers in Jesus is a much harder task than making the natural branches believers. If he could make Eskimos and Pygmies and Norwegians and Englishmen and Irishmen and Japanese people believers in Jesus, how much more easily can he take his own people and make them believers in their own Messiah? And not only does he say God can do that easily, he says he will do it. I do not want you to be uninformed of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Satan does not want the church to be prepared for the return of Jesus. We're warned that false prophets and false teachers would come in the last days, if possible, to deceive the elect. And in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, 24, Jesus warns they would use signs and wonders to do it, in some sense. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks a sign, Jesus said. Now, as a Pentecostal, I believe in signs and wonders. In Hebrew, we call them the sim v'niflaot, but as I always point out, when you see people chasing signs, Jesus called that wickedness and adultery. And they'll be deceived. Satan does not want us to be ready for Jesus to come back. That is why he is raising up false teachers these days to take the church away from what the Bible says to look for. I have no doubt whatsoever that the current events in the Middle East are of prophetic significance. It's the beginning of what Jesus said would happen, the false peace, Jerusalem being trampled down by the Gentiles, and fulfilled. I have no doubt that the events you see in the reconfederation of the Roman Empire, the countries that were in the Roman Empire, into a non-democratic model, I have no doubt that that is a prelude to the prophecies of the prophet Daniel and the Revelation, no doubt. I'm not saying that's it, but it's a prelude. Same as the false peace in the Middle East. I don't say it is the false peace of Daniel and the Antichrist, but it's a prelude to it. I have no doubt whatsoever that when you see things like ecumenism in Toronto, it is a prelude to the apostasia in Thessalonians. Therefore, the Lord himself will send a delusion upon them that they may believe what is false. So after three years in Britain and seven years with Rodney Brown, there's no revival from this. It's not simply a deception of Satan. It's a judgment from God. The prelude to that falling away. But I also have no doubt whatsoever that the increasingly large numbers of Jews turning to Jesus is what this says would happen. Richard and Sabina Wormbrand, the founders of Christ for the Communist Nations, the persecuted church, voice of the martyrs, 
They're Romanian Jews, like my wife. Some of my wife's family knew the worm brands before they were saved. And they're wonderful people. The founder of Christians in Sport, Eddie Wax, he's a Jew. I work with Helen Shapiro all the time. She's Jewish. People come up for autographs and photographs. She tells them about Jesus. Even in her concert, she gives her testimony. She's Jewish. The only person to have a number one hit single on the secular pop charts, going up to the spirit in the sky, Norman Greenbaum, is Jewish. We have increased, increasingly now, more and more Jewish Christian theologians, like E.E. Ellis and Arnold Fruchtenbaum, showing the church how to read it as a Jewish book instead of as a Hellenistic book. You see, we've turned the Hebraic faith into a Western faith. We Hellenized it. The church is only seeing part of the truth in Scripture because it's reading it with a Western mind. This is going to change. In the last days, it's going to change. It says in Daniel, seal these things up for the time of the end. The great mysteries of Daniel and Revelation, the things of the last days, will be deciphered through a Jewish understanding of the Scripture. All these things fulfill prophecy, and Satan doesn't want us to be ready. That's why you have the Kingdom Now preachers teaching Matthew 24 is not about the last days. Again, Rick Godwin, it's not about the last days. It was totally fulfilled in 70 AD. Well, it was partially fulfilled in 70 AD, but the Olivet Discourse is Matthew 24 and 25. Did Jesus separate the sheep and goats in 70 AD? Did he give his followers the rewards, what they, what they did with their talents in 70 AD? No, he didn't. You see, the very passages that Jesus gave us so we would not be deceived in the last days and so we would not be unprepared for his return, Satan is bringing false prophets into our churches and false teachers to say it's not about the last days. Israel is called God's timepiece for the nations, and he wants people not to see that. It's all part of Satan's plan to make us not ready for Jesus to come back. But Jesus is coming back. The founders of Pentecostalism were right. There will be a millennia. There will be a faithful remnant, not kingdom now theology, which is not to say we should have a bunker mentality, but it's not to say we're going to take the whole world for Christ and set up his kingdom before he comes. How can these people keep going on saying this nonsense? We're going forth triumphantly. We're going forth in power. God is blessing. The biggest year of Toronto, 1995, our Assemblies of God, their debt increased by 600%. I have the financial reports. They recently had to sell their own headquarters in Nottingham to get to get out of debt. Some blessing. The kingdom's going forth. God is blessing. God is moving. The only people who tell you that rubbish are people who don't read this and who don't read this. These people are not even living in the real world. This is the real world. And this is the real world. The purposes of God will be achieved in Jerusalem, not Toronto. What's the bottom line? The time of the Gentiles is coming to an end. The natural branches are being grafted in again. But there's one last passage in Romans 11. They are beloved for the sake of their fathers. God still loves Israel despite their rejection of Jesus because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Avot. Because of Isaiah. Because of Jeremiah. Because of John the Baptist. Because of Peter and Paul. For the sake of their fathers, they're beloved. Now that's a specific truth to Israel and the Jews. But I also believe it's a general truth. You see, I honestly believe that God still loves England for the sake of our fathers. Despite our rejection, despite the backslidden state of our church, despite the Ichabod that's written over most of our denominations, despite the fact that we have no leaders anymore, only politicians and theocrats, despite that, despite the fact that there are so few shepherds, just a lot of hirelings, despite all that, I believe God still loves England for the sake of our fathers. I honestly believe because of Charles Spurgeon 
and John Wesley and George Whitfield and Thomas Cranmer and, and John Wycliffe. I honestly believe for the sake of our fathers, God still loves England in the same character the way he does Israel for the sake of our fathers. And because of their fathers, he's going to give them another chance to repent before Jesus comes. My hope and my prayer for this nation, where my family was from, is that for the sake of our fathers, God will give Britain and England one more chance to repent before the Lord Jesus comes. But there's a caveat. Something can happen. You see, God told Ezekiel in chapter 14, verse 20, even though Noah and Daniel and Job were in its midst and I lived, they could not deliver either their son or their daughter. They would only deliver themselves. Israel reached a point like that. It reached a point where even their righteousness of their fathers could no longer have an impact on preventing God's judgment on their nation. That actually happened. I often wonder if Charles Spurgeon and John Wesley and John Wycliffe were standing before God and they came down here, if they could prevent God's judgment from coming on England anymore. You see, those men never would have rolled on the floor and laughed when babies were being systematically executed by law. Those men never would have told the church of this nation God is doing a great thing. Those men would have told the truth. They would have stood up and told you people that the judgment of God is coming. And it's persecution to expect, not revival. That's what they would have told you. But there's not enough Englishmen who will do that anymore. So God has to get an Israeli-American, a Yank, to come over here and say these things. Strange situation. There's hope. But there's not time. Time is running out. There's hope. There's still hope. But there's no time. If God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. God bless.